coming this morning. I know it was a long day yesterday and a late night, and I want to especially thank uh, Chairman Kirkpatrick for being here. Um, we have a lot of bills that have been assigned, House bills that have been assigned to this committee. I'm not sure what from yesterday we'll get in addition to what we've already got, but because we have such a short window to get this stuff done and um, so many bills, I, even though I was afraid we wouldn't have a quorum today, I wanted to go ahead and at least hear the bills. And my intention is at the next meeting to uh, just the ones we've heard and don't seem to have any issues. So like, several of these are very straightforward updates, that kind of thing. I intend to just vote them out without additional uh, time much time taken on them and in fact uh, in respect to the chairman Lumpston uh, it may be where you don't even need to come back uh, but I'll we'll communicate that with you I think I'm probably going to carry some of what you're bringing and so I could present it if need be because I know we're all going to be in a, a time crunch big time um, I am going to assign some bills to we have two uh, standing subcommittees, and uh, some of the bills that I thought were a little bit more involved are going to go to subcommittees. Uh, but don't I don't want uh, that does not indicate whether we favor or don't favor those bills. And the fact that we're having a hearing this morning does not indicate any issues with anything. It's just I, I thought that would be the best way to uh, not burn a day. I could have just not had this meeting, but I wanted to get some work done so that we can uh, be efficient later on. So I hope you understand that, Mr. Chairman. Um, with that, um, would you mind to open us in prayer? That's our tradition. And bow, with it. bow with us, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another beautiful day in Georgia and for bringing us all here safely. Help us to uh, stay calm and uh, get rest and uh, remember that we're here for 11 million Georgians and give us the ability to be wise and courageous. In your holy name, amen. Thank you. All right, so I'll call them. I have a new gavel, thanks to our rules chair. So I'll call the Senate Insurance and Labor Committee meeting to order and let the minutes note that we do not have a quorum, uh, but we are just going to hear these bills. So, Chairman Lumsden, if you'd like to present from the podium or from uh, one of those seats, the podium, good. All right. All right. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Thank you for uh, having this. I have a couple of bills uh, to bring before you. Both of these are department bills. Uh, let's uh, start with uh, House Bill 221, if that is uh, your pleasure, sir. Yes, sir. All right. And give us the LC number because things have been changing. All right. Apparently. Uh, this is um, House Bill 221. Uh, LC number 520264S. This is a department bill that comes at the request of the insurance commissioner. It deals with uh, rate filings for auto insurance. Uh, this bill keeps the current file and use model in place for the state mandated minimum filings and adds a 60 day waiting period for all other filings. This is a compromise bill that uh, all affected parties have agreed to. It provides adequate time for the department to review the filings and provides a guarantee of speed to market for the insurers. Mr. Chairman, that's the bill. I'd appreciate your support. Okay. Uh, I'm glad the compromise was reached on this. Uh, I've heard from the insurance commissioner's office. I think uh, Weston is here. Do you want to say anything to the bill, Weston? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Weston Burleson with the Insurance Commissioner's Office. Uh, I'll just echo what Chairman Lumsden said. We have um, we introduced a different version of the bill initially, worked with the industry, and got to a point that uh, we think everybody's happy with where um, 
it guarantees speed to market for the industry and allows us just to take a look at, at every filing before they go into place. And I think that's, that's just a good compromise that um, it's going to work for everybody. So we appreciate appreciate uh, the committee uh, consideration and thank you for Chairman Lundson for bringing this one. All right, and thank you. Uh, Chairman Kirkpatrick, any questions? Okay. All right, thank you. And we'll, you're up next again, uh, House Bill 222. House Bill 222, LC number 520208. This is also a department bill, uh, comes at the request of the insurance commissioner. It's a bill that clarifies the insurance department practice in four areas of the insurance code. The uh, first uh, change adds language that makes it clear that the uh, insurance department only regulates service contracts that are sold to consumers and not any other entity. Uh, the second change deals with probation, uh, probationary insurance license and extends the uh, period of a probationary license from 12 months to 24 months. Uh, the third change deals with uh, reapplication for an insurance license when the license application is denied. Uh, this allows the insurance commissioner to let applicants reapply between one and five years after refusal. Right now they have to wait five years and some license refusals and revocations are for less serious reasons than others. So this gives the commissioner some discretion. And the fourth change simply removes a code section that no longer exists. Just an update of the insurance code as to clarify the um, insurance uh, department's um, practice as it relates to these four areas. Mr. Chairman, that's the bill, and I would appreciate your favorable consideration. Okay, sir. Um, I have a question or two on this one, Chairman. Okay. Um, on fi the section one, line 15 and 16, uh, property insurance does not include service contracts sold or offered for sale to persons other than consumers, who else could there be? But well, a, a service contract, may be, you may be more familiar with it from the standpoint of something that um, you purchase, uh, extended warranty or something of that type that you, you purchase on an automobile. You as an individual may purchase that, but any other entity, whether it be a, um, a, a, a corporation, a company, a fleet, vehicle, whatever the circumstance might be, unless it's sold to an individual consumer, uh, the insurance code or the insurance commissioner's um, practices that they regulate those that are sold to individuals, but they don't regulate those to any other entity, whether it be commercial or, or um, business. Okay. And I guess that's just trying to clarify that. That's, that's the purpose of it, yes, sir. Um, And then section three, the applicant here would be a, somebody applying to be in, I guess it says it on line 56, agent, agency, limited, sub-agent, service line broker, counselor, or adjuster. So this is not uh, trying to get a certificate of authority for an insurance company, this is basically what you're reading there is current law. The only change that is being made is that, as I said, under current law, if their license has been uh, revoked uh, for whatever reason, they have to wait five years. But uh, the insurance commissioner's uh, position is that um, because some of the violations that may cause those revocations are different, more serious than others, um, he simply wants the um, ability to uh, take it on a case-by-case -case base basis so to uh, the, the suspension may be for a lesser period of time from between one and five years based on the severity of the reason for the revocation. All right, we have a question, Chairman Kirkpatrick. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Lemison, I have two questions. One is on line 65, should, the, uh, should there be or revoked after refuse to make it match the rest of the uh, section? Um, this is uh, at, this is the um, legislative council's language. If there is a issue here, the, the department may have a 
a position on that. I, I will defer to um, the insurance commissioner's office because, as I said, this, this came as a request from them. But I take your point. Uh, uh, if you have, uh, if you will, I'll, I'll let uh, Weston Burleson address that for you. Hey, thank you, uh, Chairman Kirkpatrick. Uh, this is actually just for refusals. Um, is our focus here this is folks that have applied for a license and then have been projected based on maybe what 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 might have hit uh, on their background check and this so that way let's say if, well, the example i was given is someone applies and, and we do a background check and and they have a, some pending charges and then those charges are later dropped then instead of waiting them may, making them wait five five years they can just reapply the next year is we're sort of our, our hands are tied right now if it's if it's five years if it's if it's a revocation usually i don't have us for for a more serious issue so this this wouldn't this wouldn't apply there one more follow-up, if yes, you don't mind. So the type of thing that you could be talking about on a refusal might be something uh, also insignificant, like uh, missing a deadline or something like that, or? Yeah, usually it's, you know, it's they have something on their record that's not directly impacted to selling insurance. So, you know, a DUI might be an, might be an example. We're, we're more concerned the types of things of, you know, if they're, theft or you know white collar crime things you know obviously insurance agent has access to a lot of sensitive uh, information both financial and medical records at, at times and so those are sort of things we look at uh, as opposed to you know maybe they got into some trouble in high school or something like that thank you great question so your intention is for revocations to still have the five-year uh, requirement uh, yes sir we're only talking about uh, refusals all right great and then, and then to that first question, just if I can help clarify, uh, we already interpret the code section that way. I know that's sort of what you touched on, on um, consumer service contracts versus commercial. So that's already how, how we interpret the code, but sometimes the question comes up and we thought it makes sense to just put it in statute just to make it very clear that we only regulate uh, consumer service contracts. Just, uh, and then on section four, would y'all, um, I guess flesh that out a little bit more what you're trying to what you're trying to achieve regarding public adjusters I think we had a public adjuster bill last year um, so so the change the intent behind these changes yes sir. the, the change we're making is actually in the, the language we passed in the new bill uh, last year and I think our our general counsel who helped help draft it was just kind of rereading re the code make sure everything was everything looked good and we just saw some drafting errors and so essentially there was a reference to a code section that actually doesn't exist anymore and then if you look at uh number 10 i feel like it it, it combined if you look at the stuff that's crossed out a b and c under that i think it sort of just cleaned that up made it made it look a little more a uh, flow a little more um flow a little better and and just you know concise uh, we actually ran this by the public adjusters just to make sure they understood we weren't trying to do anything a substance of changing the actual law that we've already passed and they, they they gave us the thumbs up they said they didn't have any concerns it's just just to clean up language okay and i think uh they're they're uh um the, the folks who handle government affairs for them are actually in the room and they can speak to that if, if you have a question for them all right y'all good with it thank you uh any questions all right senator harvin thank you for coming okay thank you question on the public adjusters is there a cooling off period with public adjusters because many times they are calling a, a, the, the the insurer the client and making an, a pitch if you will for their services prior to anything really occurring in the in the claim and my question is is there a, cur a cooling off period because they're signing a contract uh, from for whatever the fees are that are involved and was just curious if that was present in any of the contracts or any of the agreements uh, I know one of the changes we made in the bill last year is they, they're not allowed to solicit during a declared public uh, emergency by the governor and so I think I don't know if that that addressed your question so if you know a tornado or you know a hurricane or uh, imminent or have just hit they, they can't come in you know the next day and and get people while they're you know in the middle of cleaning up and you know might have gone through some traumatic experience they have, they have that would be a cooling off period right there they have to wait till the emergency uh, declaration expires but that's only in a declared emergency would not be for a fire or anything of that nature correct 
Uh, I don't believe so. I can I can verify and get back to you. If you don't mind verifying, yes, sir. I, I, I've had one case where we had a large fire, and believe it or not, it happened that night and that morning. They had a public adjusters, you know, calling, and I think there. And once I talked, we we talked. I said, okay, give us a chance to, you know, you can't do it that fast. And I think that's something that would be wise if, if it's not there and needs to be there as a cooling off period of five to ten days, whatever, uh, to let the insurance companies do what they're supposed to do. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Thank you, Chairman Lumsden. Very helpful. Have, have a, I think that's it for you. Have a great day. My good friend, Representative DeLoach, House Bill 294. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We'll be working off a substitute that I'm offered that would just clean up a little language in the original bill. That LC is 520302S. That's what we have, I think. Thank you, sir. Let's see. This yes, yes, sir. bill uh, comes from the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. It's model legislation. Deals with something that happens fairly infrequently. Uh, it, it, it is about reinsurance contracts when the seeding insurer is placed in liquidation. And, and basically what this bill does is there, there, there are three entities that might stand up uh, and protect policyholders when uh, a, a company is placed in liquidation. The first one of those is the uh, Guarantee Association, and this bill deals with both the Georgia Association or it might be a foreign association. Uh, the, the second entity that might stand up would be the insurance commissioner named as the liquidator in that liquidation. What has happened in Georgia in every case I'm aware of is we find an assuming insurer, which simply means another company who's willing to basically, in property and casually, we talk about taking it on a border road basis. They just take over the book of business, take over the stream of income, and, and policyholders are protected in all three of those cases. What we want to do with this bill is guarantee that Whichever one of those three entities stands up to protect the policyholders has the right to assume and continue that reinsurance contract. There's a lot of language in this bill because in each one, each one of those three entities, the process would be a little bit different. But it, it basically spells out so everybody knows how it's going to work. The process, the time frame for notifying the reinsurer that you want to continue the contract spells out it goes back to the date of liquidation. Uh, in, in the case that that entity that stands up does not want to continue the contract, it spells out how they part company, how you determine who owes whom in that case, and then finally it has a arbitration section that spells out what happens if they don't agree to an amount of money to, to settle up, you, you go through that arbitration process. The substitute changes just a few things in the original bill. First of all, on line three, it adds health insurers whereas that was not in the original bill when it, when it talks about what this bill deals with. On line four, it changes the Georgia Guarantee Association to a guarantee association, which simply would include foreign guarantee associations. And this normally would come into play when you have a Georgia reinsurer and, and they're dealing with a guarantee association in another state. Uh, that and finally the change on the last page on the back line 183 and 184 
is something that the Georgia Guarantee Association requested just to make it clear that nothing in this bill is going to change the legislation that created that Guarantee Association back in 84, 85. Okay. Good explanation. We have a question. Chairman Kirkpatrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question relates to the health part of the bill because, as you know, we're in a transition period with the exchange programs from the um, federal exchange to a state exchange, and, and our waiver 1332 created a reinsurance program, which is already making a difference in the state of Georgia. I just want to be sure that we're contemplating how that all fits together with what you're talking about here, because I guess those companies could go out of business too. Yes, ma'am. So that that's why the health was added in, in this substitute. There was a request to do that, and I think the department probably agreed with that change. And this is not a department bill, but I think I'm safe in saying that the department supports the bill. Any further questions? All right. Representative Loach, thank you. We have somebody signed up, uh, Mr. Stacy Freeman with Munich American. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh -huh. Hey, good morning, good morning Ms. Stacy. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Stacy Freeman. I represent Munich American Reassurance Company. That is a Georgia domestic reinsurance company formed in Georgia in the 1950s. And for those that may not be familiar with reinsurers, all they do is insure other insurance companies, other licensed insurance companies. So Munich American is what they refer to as a professional reinsurer. They don't sell to the consuming public. They only sell to other licensed insurance companies. And so we appreciate uh, Chairman Deloach bringing this legislation, and we do support it and have attempted to work with all the parties, make sure everybody's comfortable. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions? All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last on our agenda this morning, as far as bills go, we didn't get a chance to hear Senate Bill 224, uh, but we want to hear it hear it today. This is a two-year uh, biennial process. So, would you like to go to the sure. podium? Sure. Thank you. This is from Vice Chairman Harbin. <clears throat> Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to uh, do the presentation on this. This is really a life insurance bill of rights, and because life insurance is for life, it's not usually something that's, it's not like a property casualty policy that's changing or anything of that nature. It's something many times that is for the life of the person and for what's going on. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, page two or, or section three, kind of outlines what's going on, but the first is one in which there is a, um, the insurer has a policy and there's a change in ownership of the company many times or uh, agent is no longer licensed with that company. Uh, companies don't like to keep you licensed because they have to pay a fee. But what this has to do is that when such company, let's say your agent dies or he retires, things of that nature, unless the policy was bought directly from the company, they would give you the option of a local agent rather than home office is what you'll usually see on the annual statements. It just says home office 1-800 and dial this number. Um, and for some, some things that may be okay, but as a general rule, the complications of the life insurance policy are hard for um, the consumer to really deal with. And this first one deals with it. An agent uh, would be at least have an option of having a local agent in their state or in their, their geographical area. The second part has to do with a right of, I call it counsel, uh, to own a policy. For instance, many times I'm doing a review uh, of policies for a client, and his agent could be dead, his agent could be out of business, and to get information from another company is extremely hard if I'm not licensed with that company and not recognized with that company. So what I have asked here is the ability that a, um, the, the client would have to give you a written notice, just like you would, for, for me to be able to represent them 
between the company and them because I'm not licensed with the company, but yet the consumer many times doesn't even know the questions to ask that are there. And so th what this does, there would be a form prescribed by the uh, commissioner and it would be signed and it would just give me, when I call, let's say, uh, a company, I can say I have this form, I'm going to send it to you electronically or I'm going to send it to you in, in fax form and it would give me the ability just to talk to them and not have to be licensed with that company. Um, uh, especially with intersensitive products and things of that nature, many times you're having to ask for reprojections, you're having to ask questions that normally the insured really does not r realize, especially on older contracts where interest rates were at one time seven, eight, nine percent, we need reprojections done and that requires multiple phone calls. What you find is it's very hard when they will not deal with you and they say, well, let's deal with the client and the client's really having to go back and forth and that's just something that's very, very foreign to them. The third part of this bill uh, is in um, line 44 is an annual statement and let me explain to you what happens. Um, and most of this is on older policies. If you don't know what a debit policy is, debit policy was where they would actually go door to door and collect the money. And there's a lot of those uh, that are out there. And a policy, once it's paid up in a paid up status, there's, if there's no correspondence going on, how do you know it's there or you do you forget it's there? Or what we are seeing more and more, as people get older and their children are dealing with it, it's very hard for them to get it if there's not. Uh, in my office, I have a, uh, one of my uh, account managers, her grandfather bought a policy on her mother, and it was a 20-pay policy 35 years ago. He had been dead 14 years, and going through his paperwork, they find a policy. And this is another issue that we see. The company had been sold three times, so that following through the issues, they didn't even know it existed, and it was worth about $7,000. But if, when, once she gave me the policy, it took a period of time to do that. And I really believe that a, as a policy holder, uh, you, you should have a, an, at least an annual statement that something's there. I hate to say this, but uh, I don't know about you, but I get these privacy notices that are at the federal level and I'm kind of going, okay, you didn't sell my information out. I understand that. But this is just simply a consumer issue that we're seeing. And especially as people get older, you need more and more. Now the industry's dealt with some of that, by giving uh, beneficiaries and even third party uh, capabilities that you can give a third party, your son, daughter, attorney, a CPA. That's starting to come with our newer policies. But older policies, that's not true. Especially not true on the small policies that were sold. We call them burial policies, things of that nature. That's just not present in today and people don't know uh, about that. So it's a policy to protect the policyholders of Georgia to help us help them and that's the big part because there's a fee if you're licensed with a company. Sometimes they don't want to deal with you unless you're licensed and that makes a problem. So that's really what this bill is about and uh, I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Chairman, this is uh, SP 224 LC 520270. Yeah. Are there any questions for the author? All right. No questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do have uh, somebody signed up to speak on this. It's a Mr. Robert Potter, I think it is, State Farm. Mr. Potter, are you yes. new to the are you new to this area? I don't yes, know sir. I am. I am, the, I am new to this area. <laughs> sometimes I go by Robert and sometimes Bobby. But. So uh, I'll be. I will likewise be brief this morning uh, for this hearing only. Uh, Bobby Potter, on behalf of State Farm and ACLI, and I say that in this circumstance because uh, when I receive this bill. Uh, I do what I always do and send it up to the clients and say, what, what do you think and what is, what is this trying to solve and what, what's your response? From the standpoint of State Farm, they're different, in the sen different from other insurers in the sense that they use dedicated agents. Um, so their response was slightly different. As uh, Senator Harbin went through with A, B, C, and D, with uh, A in this bill uh, about uh, 
when an agent has retired or deceased, State Farm would be in the business of replacing that agent, naming one. So their, their short answer to A is we already do this. Their short answer to B about uh, providing company illustrations, information status, reprojections, and all that, essentially, we already do this. And that if, some, if somebody asks for a third party to receive that information, they would say, we already do this. And then in regard to C, they say, we already do this. Uh, so from that perspective, I don't, I, I, other than saying, this is private enterprise and we already do all these things anyway, I'm not sure why uh, government would require us to do this or change our policies or procedures. They, they pretty much do it anyway. From the standpoint of ACLI, however, that uh, is the trade association with 432 different life insurers uh, licensed in the state of Georgia. So there are different folks that have different policies and procedures and there's a distinction between customer service between one and the other and in some cases that's what distinguishes one company from another uh, and, and i'm not positive of online sales but i know there's a, certainly a number of online sales in the world of property and casualty i expect there is and in, in life insurance as well uh, where there is not a local agent and this this bill seems to require uh, the appointment of a local agent and in, at line 40, with or without regard to whether uh, one is licensed uh, with that company. So there's concerns from that perspective that ACLI has expressed to me that uh, it, it may impair the right to contract between the company and a local agent. And if it seems to obligate a company to give in, information to an agent that has no Con contractual relationship at all uh, with that company. So for those reasons, there's concern. I'm not, uh, the, uh, Senator Harbin didn't, didn't e express anything relative to compensation. I know compensation in the life insurance world is different than others, uh, but I don't know how uh, th that agent that would be called upon would be compensated and how that would work. It was just, I'm, I'm, I'm not clear on that here. So I know that ACLI has expressed some concerns, therefore I express those concerns to you all. Any questions for Mr. Potter? Thank you. So Mr. Potter, I, I have a question. The, um, the, the part about a third party, a, a, another agent representing this life insurance client and that's not contracted with the life insurance company, um, what knowledge or information on that agent would the life insurance company have as far as their training, whether they've uh, been trained on the terrorism and money laundering aspect of uh, life insurance and whether they're reputable or uh, taking advantage of the client or and what recourse would they have if that was the case and so mr. chairman that was a bunch of questions but I, I, th I think the answer would be um, as written they likely would have none uh, if, if the if the policy elder is saying I would like you to use agent X, they don't know Agent X, and they don't know the background of that that person. I'm, I'm not sure they could know. Now, and the, do, I know it, it's all over the board, but I, I, I'm in the business, so I mean, some companies are pretty selective and careful who they appoint yes, to sir. be an agent, based on a lot of factors, um, reputation being one of them. Uh, training background that kind of thing yes sir i think that would be the case across the board and that would be i mean that would be a distinction between one carrier and another just like uh, one carrier might s select one uh, agent another might decline to, to select that agent I, you know th this is not the world of lawyer advertising and i hesitate to even mention that except that it would seem like there would be a possibility of 
advertising for clients by agents. This, uh, I know Senator Hartman has presented this as a, uh, a citizen's policyholder right, but it's, it's favoring agents in a way that, I don't know, I'd be concerned about, about agents advertising. You could come to me notwithstanding whoever your agent is, or if your agent is deceased, or uh, I'm not sure how that would work, and I'm not sure how the compensation piece of that would work. I, I appreciate very much the intent of this. I, I just, it does raise some questions. I do think the agent company relationship, my understanding as an agent for 27 years, is we can be held out as an agent to be the representing the company, and the company can be held liable for our actions. Yes, sir. Because we're, uh, in fact, uh, representing them in the public, and uh, so it. I wonder how that concept, you know, plays in. I mean, in some of my early training, if if information as an agent is presented to me by a client or money is received by me, the court has deemed that as being given to the insurance company. Uh, yes, sir, and I suspect uh, policyholders would would match you with the insurance company almost as if you are a part of that insurance company because of your relationship. So I think those are just some things we would need to sort out. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. <clears throat> just in recognizing this is that probably there are three different systems that we're dealing with. One is a direct system where you buy your policy directly from the carrier and there's no agent involved at all. That's one that we deal with. Another is where you deal with a direct agent similar to what you're talking about with State Farm and State Farm does a good job because they're going to assign that policy to an agent if they have a death or retirement. When you get to the independent side, that's a little different from that standpoint because of the fees involved with licensing and things of that nature. So it's a different world between the direct and the um, uh, captive agent uh, process. What I see is this is the in a form is what I call a limited power of attorney to be able to request information. Understanding the other part is that many companies have been sold one, two, and three times to what we call runoff companies. And these are companies that that basically are there just to let the policy lapse. To be honest with you, they like it to lapse because that releases the company of the liability that's there if we get down to brass tacks. And what happens sometimes is getting information is extremely, can be extremely hard, especially if you're going back three and four times. So that my, my purpose in that is from practical experience, many times you may not make any, uh, anything compensation wise, you're there uh, because you're handling other lines of business for them, or I've got one now that I'm handling, they brought me their parents' policy, the agent's dead, the company's been sold, and so we're trying to find information, and mom and dad are not really capable of handling their own financial affairs, so we're trying to work through that process. That's why I think even the annual statement makes a lot of sense, just to know that it's there, and I will tell you that it, with the smaller policies, especially where it's been sold a couple of times, and if it's paid up, there's an issue there that, that our, the citizens of Georgia, uh, I believe, need to be represented. and so. Thank you for your comments, and I understand you do what you do, and you do it well. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, in, in terms of the, the the right to counsel, and as you indicated, when you get down to brass tacks, there are some policies that lapse, and there's some folks at, uh, that are in the business of trying to buy those policies. You see that advertisement um, all the time. So that's that's a business component that's I think probably separate than what you're trying to do here. Right. Understood. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <coughs> yes, sir. Just a quick question. Um, I mean, I think all sitting around this table and, and Mr. Potter all understand my background and out of ignorance and uh, maybe not understanding what all we do here in this building related to tort reform and insurance and everything else. Who represents the insured? I hear that the company's represented by the agents and others, and, and I appreciate that, that, that they're employees of that. and. But who represents the, the consumer, 
the the insured when they get their policy is it buyer beware that they are responsible for understanding every corner of these voluminous documents that they're required to to fill out and sign when they when they purchase this product and once they do because i have a great relationship um with my i happen to be with state farm everything i have and i make a phone call when i scatter deer shrapnel all over <laughs> alabama at two in the morning left a message and the next morning my my agent had me lined up to get my car repaired and everything else but um and listening to this conversation i, I realized that you know her obligation is is to the company and so is there somewhere in the insurance industry and i don't i'm not trying to be uh mean because i i know some really good insurance people uh chairman being one of them but uh who represents the the insured the citizen so the agent has a dual dual role i mean clearly in in the state farm model the agent is works for state farm but they have a fiduciary responsibility and a duty to to be ethical and honest to the client too um, and so it is a an independent agents which is what chairman harbin and i are uh, it, it's a dual role and it, it uh, sometimes it does create um, we're serving two masters Conflicts. at times, right? I mean, you, you might yeah. want to speak to it, yeah. too. I yeah. mean, that's a great question. Yeah. It's a great question because you do have a dual obligation, but because we represent multiple carriers, uh, for instance, you call me and say, company A is, you know, had a rate increase or I wasn't happy with their service. I always say this, we don't just serve vanilla ice cream. We have strawberry, chocolate, we have other options for you from that standpoint and as an independent agent we can represent you to the best carrier that we think will meet your needs and is the best benefit for you so i see it as a my responsibility i see more to the client uh, i have a responsibility to the carrier but i have a choice and i do not if if xyz company says no i say great and I, I say it this way one man's garbage is another man's treasure there are companies that say we wouldn't write those any time at all and yet there are companies that says, man, we love them. We'll write them all, the, all day long. And that's the power of choice and the power of a free market. Well, and, and I appreciate that. My, my thing is, is, you know, to, to what the chairman was talking about, if, if, I, if, if I go in there and I, I hand you mine and, and you have to have those companies, you have to have relationships with those companies to be able to order to operate your business. Right. And so there has to be a certain amount of, um, of dedication to those that, that give you the product that you're allowed to sell. Right. And for you to be successful, I have to come in the door and buy that product. And I think it's sometimes there's a push where, you know, does my loyalty lie with company ABC or does my loyalty lie with, with Randy Roberts and the, the <laughs> consumer? And so it's, it's, it's just a question and I'm sure, uh, I know where the chairman's office is and I'm sure we'll have more conversation about this. But I'm just concerned because as we talk about tort reform and everything else through this capital, I know where the loyalty of the trial attorneys lies. I know where the loyalty of the, the big insurance companies lie. And then I see a wandering mass of citizens out there that seem to be without uh, support. And so that was, that was my concern on things like this because We've, we've, I've told the story too many times. When my dad died, we discovered insurance policies. And thankfully, I have good friends in the insurance business that I could call and say, hey, I'm way out of my depth on this, what do I do? And they said, well, here's the process. But I was one of the lucky ones. For those that don't have those relationships, I just wonder, you know, are they, are they taken care of? But thank you. You're right, Chairman, that's, I mean, that's a good issue. and. It is a, uh, sometimes it's a, a dilemma, but we at my office feel like we're, we're counselors. We're not pressure salespeople. We're, we feel like we're like a, your CPA would be right. or your attorney would be. Um, we feel like we're counseling the customer, but the court holds us out as, I mean, there's a lot of court cases where if we don't, um, disclose to the company what the client has told us that's right then the court will has deemed that the company knows because they just 
we don't we're not employees of the company but we are uh, we do have a contractual relationship and certain obligations to them too so that's what I say it's a it's a dual role because we're contractually obligated to uh, do certain things and and be open and honest and transparent with our companies and we would you know good agents would do that anyway regardless of the contract but we're legally required to do that but our office advocates for the customer and counsels the customer and tries to there there's plenty of um th it's a wonderful industry yeah. because there's everybody just about you meet is a potential client so it's <laughs> not like you have to um do things uh, unethical or I mean, just go on to the next one if, if somebody's wanting you to do something that's not right or whatever. Yeah. I mean, is that fair? Yeah. <laughs> Lucas has been in it, too. Uh, well, you know, one, one of the things, if, if, if you have a family that, uh, and they discover an insurance policy, the policy has a number on it. It has the name of the company. You call the company, give them the policy number. If you really have problems, you call the insurance commissioner's office, and I guarantee he he can get to the, the bottom of it, especially if it's a payout and they had a life policy. The agent's gone, and maybe the company's been bought by somebody else. But there's a policy number that referenced the client who the insurance is on. And so when I've had a problem, i call called the insurance commissioner's office. They got the policy number the company and everything, and the next thing I knew, the people were satisfied because the insurance commission office had called them and got it all straight now. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, good conversation. Uh, I've got two, uh, we set up at the beginning of the session two standing subcommittees. One is for property and casualty and one is for life and health. Uh, Senator Kirkpatrick chairs the Property and Casualty Committee. Senator Lucas, you're on that one. Senator Calzert and Senator Robertson. Uh, and we're assigning two bills to your subcommittee, House Bill 480 and House Bill 518. And the meeting to uh, vet those bills is Monday morning at 8 a.m. in this, this room. So that's Kirkpatrick, Lucas, Calzert, and Robertson. Mr. Chairman, did you say 480 and 518? I think yes. I did, yes, yes. sir. Thank you. House bills. And then uh, the health, life and health, is chaired by uh, Senator Harbin. It includes Senator Gooch, Harbison, Merritt, and Kennedy. Uh, and we are assigning two House bills to that committee. House Bill 315 and House Bill 63. So when you get a time and room schedule for that, uh, Vice Chairman, if you'll let Kyle Ann know and she'll get the notice out. Okay. All right, is there any other business today? All right, thank y'all for coming. Have a good day. Meeting adjourned. Hit it hard now. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>